Good evening, everybody. The uh, Zero Z models are coming in rapidly right now. And I wanted to start off with a low level jet with a three kilometer NAM. This is the forecast for 21Z, 3 p.m. tomorrow, and it shows basically a 60 to 70 knot low level jet dominating a large section of Mississippi, Alabama, all the way up into western and central Tennessee, even up into southeastern Kentucky up there. And definitely is a pretty concerning model run here from the three kilometer NAM. The instability axis though, goes just up to Tennessee at 21Z, up to the Kentucky border, up into the south central portion of Kentucky by about 23Z, so this is about 5 p.m. Look at these gravity waves too, with that low level jet just surging here, jet streak as well. Uh, heading over top this uh, very large uh, instability axis. The good news is that at least that warm front doesn't make it all the way up to the Ohio River anymore, but it does nose up into south central Kentucky by about 0Z, about 6 p.m. So this environment is a very favorable swath for those long track tornadoes. And uh, this definitely looks like a, a potentially dangerous day tomorrow. Definitely need to have your safety plans in place. Looks like multiple bands of renegade storms. And I have been following this little kink within this boundary. And I think that especially just to the north of this kink, there could even be a very a more favorable environment for those t tornadoes. Middle Tennessee into south central Kentucky. Going into 1Z, the environment compresses a little bit down into eastern Mississippi into western Alabama. And today we had those renegade supercells that developed uh, near the Birmingham area. One just went just to the southeast of Hoover. I uh, broadcast that live here uh, on Facebook, and uh, then uh, another supercell developed just off to the east, and that's the one that produced that substantial tornado right, right along the I-20 corridor just to the west of the Atlanta area. And if we can get renegade supercells in an environment like we had today, then I think that tomorrow uh, definitely is a sign of some uh, more favorable uh, renegade supercells as well. And uh, watch the shape of that kink as well. And uh, we can also look at the timing of these storms. This is at 18Z. So you can see this large warm front from the surface low into central Arkansas, extends off to the east. We'll look at the uh, three kilometer NAM. We'll also look at some of the ensemble data. But that's that surface low and it's gonna ride up along this warm front. And then multiple confluence bands are gonna be developing within that warm sector. Uh, so far, most of the models also do have a relatively cool bias. So I think that the temperatures are gonna be warmer. The dew points are certainly going to be higher. Uh, this is the three kilometer NAM, uh, which seems to have a more accurate representation of the dew points for tomorrow. And uh, we can also uh, look at the evolution of that low level jet, but just look at these big time dew points here surging up through the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, storms will likely be ongoing tomorrow morning uh, back into Arkansas. And this is at 20 Z. So we're talking at about 2 p.m. And you have this line of storms that's going through Arkansas. You also have a line of storms that extends from western Tennessee up into western Kentucky. But you can certainly see the evidence of these confluence bands out into the open warm sector. And uh, if those confluence bands convect, then I think this is going to be a substantial outbreak. Usually during the winter time, the short range models like this certainly do have a relatively cool uh, PBL a bias for those surface temperatures. And, uh, but you can certainly see the hint at these confluence lines, southeastern Mississippi up through northwestern Alabama, another one possibly central Mississippi up into southwestern Tennessee there. Those could very easily be renegade supercells. And you can see the three kilometer dam begins to light those up at about 5 to 6 p.m. There's a chance that if none of these confluence lines are able to develop renegade supercells, and it is also possible uh, that just this rapidly moving squall line with embedded tornadic circulations could also move along it. Here you can see that surface low starting to move up along that boundary. There is the warm front moving all the way up to the southern tip of Ohio even. And so severe weather and tornado potential definitely possible anywhere to the south and southeast of that line. But the three kilometer dam just does hint at these renegade supercells within these prefrontal confluence lines. The HRRR, which definitely did a better job also with the December 10 and 11 outbreak, has much uh, more uh, in terms of much more widespread in terms of the thunderstorms initiating. Uh, this is at 21Z. This is at 3 p.m. And look at these storms developing from that classic confluence line that develops from southeastern Mississippi all the way up into northwestern Alabama, eventually into Middle Tennessee, all the way into eastern Kentucky. 
And uh, then you can see another band, a uh, prefrontal confluence line that develops from northern Mississippi, even across the western portion of Tennessee. And all of these are going to have the chance of producing strong, long track uh, tornadoes. And they're going to be moving at 60 to 70 miles an hour, very rapid storm motions with these as well as they move uh, northeast uh, through the warm sector. There you can see some of those renegade storms moving from eastern Mississippi through northwestern Alabama. Uh, just multiple bands of convection. And this is definitely a concerning trend because it went from being relatively minimum in terms of the number of storms uh, that exist across the warm sector to being pretty substantial. And I can uh, pan a little bit down and you can see just how far south some of the uh, convection along those prefrontal confluence lines exist all the way from southern Mississippi up through western Alabama, northwestern Alabama, all the way up. And uh, as you go in time, stepping forward, they don't weaken. And in fact, they intensify in advance. And you can see that they maintain that discrete cell cellular mode, uh, central Alabama, all the way up into eastern Tennessee by this time. This is at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., stepping forward. Multiple bands, prefrontal uh, confluence bands here of supercell storms. You've got this one. Another round developing multiple bands all the way eastern Tennessee, central Alabama, northwestern Alabama, eastern Mississippi as well, all the way up into eastern Kentucky, and eventually even into western uh, West Virginia gets into the action. Uh, and all of those are going to be embedded within a 60 to 70 knot low-level jet. There's that massive low-level jet. And if you do look at uh, zero to one kilometer EHIs, you can even pick out the individual confluence lines within the EHI field. And that's a composite index that basically combines your zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity, also your surface base cape. And uh, if you step forward a little bit, we can watch how this evolves in the EHI field. And you can certainly see these prefrontal confluence lines of favorable pathways, basically of surface base instability and very strong zero to one kilometer shear. You can certainly see this kink in the boundary that's much more uh, prominent within the HRRR model and uh, storms that are able to develop along this section of the boundary will be able to more rapidly move off of that boundary. Hopefully uh, everything's working here. My audio is still broadcasting. Looks like it is still up and running. But the HRRR model here looks very dangerous with these pathways here of surface base instability and also favorable zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity where those storms are going to move. But you can see that the, this is basically a fire hose of supercells from southern Mississippi into eastern Mississippi. You can look at some of these forecast soundings as well. And these are classic Dixie Alley type soundings, fast moving tornadoes. Uh, the sh relatively shallow critical angles as compared to tornadoes that you can get in the Great Plains. That critical angle being the angle between the zero to one kilometer shear vector and that storm motion vector right there. Critical angle 42 degrees. My former office mates actually started the research on the critical angle of the hotograph. Don Giuliano and John Esther held uh, finding that 90 degrees represents intake of purely streamwise vorticity. But with these setups that are dominated by speed shear like this, you can get like a 40 to 50 knot, zero to one kilometer shear vector, basically the length of this vector, your surface wind here, south southwesterly surface wind at about 10 knots, one kilometer wind about 50 knots, that's probably conservative. Uh, the three kilometer NAM even has 60 to 70 knot winds up there, one to two kilometers. And then you have this little textbook kink between two and four kilometers that is so prominent uh, with these types of long track uh, hodographs. And you can see a south-southwesterly surface wind at about 15 knots, going up to 50 knots out of the south-southwest. Dry pocket of air coming in in the mid-levels of the atmosphere between 700 and 500 millibars. That's that elevated mix layer that we talk about so often during these uh, weather briefings. And that's because this is a tandem trough ejection. Uh, the trough ejection uh, basically digs this trough uh, from just off of Baja, California. I can show you that tandem trough ejection here really quick. And uh, traditionally, these wintertime setups uh, with these tandem trough ejections are the most dangerous because it basically creates a much larger warm sector that has a very strong wind shear. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the period, actually right now when this model run begins. And you can see that closed upper low comes all the way from off of Baja, and then it's dragged across northern Mexico, basically the southwestern U.S. as well, picks up that dry pocket of air from just above the ground at the mid-levels of the atmosphere. You've got your parent trough diving southward through the western U.S., so that classic positive tilt, 
lot of flow on the backside, helping that trough to dig. And it's going to cause this cutoff flow to pivot out in front of it, basically eject as a jet streak. But uh, these closed upper lows, when they are ejected out ahead of a trough like that, oftentimes will maintain their identity a little bit longer, maintain their spin, and even give the entire warm sector a bit of spin overall as well. And you can step forward and watch how this thing evolves. Turns into a jet streak that's going to eject out ahead of this. You have a positively tilted trough here, negatively tilted trough axis that's embedded within that. That sometimes can go under the radar from even the most skilled of meteorologists. But certainly could see this trough axis ejecting. It does have a bit more of a positive tilt than the December 10 and 11 setup. It also digs a little bit further to the south. And that subtropical ridge extends further west in the Gulf of Mexico, which is going to lead to just slightly more unidirectional shear profiles across a larger area. So there definitely are some subtle differences in this setup. But here you can see that jet streak surging out across that warm sector. It creates a very large low-level jet, basically your flow from about a one kilometer above the ground from eastern Texas across Louisiana, southeastern Arkansas, central northern Mississippi, large swath of Tennessee, even nosing up into southern Kentucky, and eventually eastern Kentucky as you go forward with time. This is just 11Z in the morning here. Probably there'll be tornado warnings ongoing by this time in the morning hours. But that's why you have such a large trough like that. Probably could even get some tornado warnings back here into central Arkansas about 7, 8 p.m. And uh, this is all isentropic lift uh, just off to the east of it massive warm advection happening uh, because of that low-level jet. And I know I was just a little bit too far north with that, so let's pan down and show you that low-level jet there. So I'm going to wake up at about 4 in the morning and definitely continue to analyze the models. I think that this surface flow is going to eject right along that boundary, pretty close to where that kink is located. Here you can see the, uh, uh, the anti-cyclone off to the southeast, and that squeeze play between that high pressure and the ejecting trough, especially that lead shortwave trough, creates a very large low-level jet axis. And basically you get these pathways uh, where uh, conditions come together, conducive for even long track, potentially strong to violent tornadoes across a very large swath. And that's at 14Z, so you're just going to have several hours. Look at that egg-shaped 850 low right there, centered over Missouri, southeastern Kansas. Strong low-level jet pushing 70 knots there. Western Tennessee pushing into middle Tennessee, into central, south central and eastern Kentucky. So this trough is certainly deep enough to encourage the development of those renegade storms. This right here is your classic 500 millibar for these wintertime outbreaks. Parent trough, more of a positive tilt back to the west. You have a lead uh, trough that's picked up off of Baja, ejected off to the east of that trough, rockets off to the northeast, and uh, that just leads to these multiple confluence bands of supercells moving over rapidly over this area, 60 to 70 miles an hour. My plan is to stay in front of these storms. Uh, they're going to be moving rapidly, so... I'll be playing a little bit out to the east. I'll be waiting for these storms to come to me. A lot of times you only get one chance uh, to even visualize storms like this. But it does look like at least the deeper dew points are south central Tennessee, back into northeastern Mississippi, eastern Mississippi, and you can definitely see those confluence lines within the dew point field as well. Zooming in a little bit closer, look at those well-defined confluence lines, those higher dew points. At least the 0Z HRRR is better. You remember the 12Z HRRR was really underdoing those dew points. Uh, even some low 60s out there. A couple of these little dry swaths, but I think that just shows you where these confluence lines are going to form. You can probably fill in the gaps here with some of those bigger dew points. But these are just going to serve as a fire hose of supercell storms that are going to move rapidly northeast through the warm sector. And all the way up into eastern Tennessee. My friends out there, northwestern Georgia, Chattanooga area, keep an eye out for those storms. Could be tornadic, certainly. Fire hose of a confluence line into central Alabama. So 
So it looks like a dangerous day to me. I think that this w definitely would probably warrant an upgrade uh, to the Storm Prediction Center risk. But I think that, you know, even an enha a large enhanced risk with a 10% hatch area tornado probabilities is a, a great forecast for that far in advance. But I wouldn't be surprised to see an upgrade to a moderate risk with this event, uh, very similar in timing uh, to what we had uh, to uh, with that upgrade. Uh, but definitely very moist out there. Multiple bands of convection that are moving through. Definitely need to stay tuned uh, to those severe weather watches and warnings. I'll be storm chasing, so I'm not the best uh, source for that severe weather watch and warning information because I can't stay tuned to all the different storms that are happening. Uh, your local meteorologists are a great source to break down that radar. Now casting in real time as those tornadoes are happening. Uh, there's a lot of YouTubers even that are broadcasting 24-7 these days that provide great updates. And hopefully the uh, news networks also are able to broadcast throughout the duration of this outbreak as well because certainly it does look like to, it's going to be a dangerous uh, outbreak ahead. But it's also important to use your own resources to stay tuned to those watches and warnings. Uh, apps like Radar Scope, Radar Omega are great apps to stay tuned to those watches and those warnings. Um, having the ability to receive those warnings by your mobile device during the day, and just simply having a safety plan in place. All of those things are what are needed. Everybody that lives in this area is very familiar with severe weather and tornadoes, generally knows what to do when severe weather strikes. And uh, I'm simply just going to increase awareness that it looks like a dangerous day uh, is going to unfold on New Year's Day and also tomorrow night as well. And I'll be up very early streaming live storm chasing and trying to break down uh, this outbreak the best that I can. So have a good night, everybody. I'm going to go to sleep and I'll be up before sunrise, about four or five in the morning and uh, chasing this track meet of a severe weather event as these storms will likely be moving rapidly southwest to northeast at speeds of about 60 to 70 miles an hour.